So Long Island, uh, just on a, a short personal note before we get started, uh, always happy to be uh, talking about Long Island wine. Uh, I am a Long Island native, born and raised, uh, not too far, maybe about a 35-minute drive from uh, from most of the vineyards, I'd say, out in Port Jeff. Uh, and, um, you know, I live in England now. I don't get back to Long Island much. And so the work that I've been doing with the New York Wine and Grape Foundation uh, and Long Island Wine Country has been just a, a real treat over the last few years. Um, I still got the accent, so uh, we can talk about Long Island, uh, you know. Uh, I'm going to have to just thicken it up a little bit more to kind of balance Russell. Russell, you haven't picked it up much. No, uh, I've tried not to. I've tried not to. <laughs> Worked hard at that one. Yeah, uh, but I, I'll tell you, um, I've had a, a wonderful journey with, uh, with Long Island wines. I used to take trips out when I was living in New York City, um, kind of before I got started in, in the wine industry proper for you know, pumpkin picking and wine days, and they were uh, always a, a ton of fun. Um, and then as I got more into wine, I uh, uh, um, had the pleasure of kind of going back in with a kind of fresh look at it all and uh, could not be happier with the quality, uh, the level of quality that we're seeing today. And so um, let's dive right in. Uh, we have Long Island is the southeastern tip of New York State. It is the largest island in the contiguous United States. It's about 120 miles long, um, which shouldn't take three hours to drive the length of, but it does, uh, <laughs> and about 23 miles at its widest. Um, it stretches from the East River uh, uh, on the, uh, the city side into the Atlantic Ocean, and it is shouldered by the Long Island Sound to the north. Uh, the Long Island AVA, is the entirety of the two counties on the eastern part of the island. That's Nassau County and Suffolk County. Suffolk County extending out to the forks on the east. Uh, and the majority of the 90 or so wineries are located in, again, that eastern bit of Suffolk County. Uh, and so we'll continue on. We've got a good look here. You have two sub AVAs with Long Island. Uh, you have the Hamptons Long Island AVA on the south and orange. You have the North Fork of Long Island um, AVA on the top there in blue, gray, green, whatever that is. And then uh, the entirety of the island again, containing the Long Island AVA. And so um, unique to Long Island uh, for all intents and purposes, there are few, if any, uh, wines produced from hybrid native grapes. Um, and there's definitely, it's few, it, it, there are some, I've had them. Um, but uh, a lot of those grapes are also brought from other New York state regions uh, down to Long Island. And so, um, you know, they obviously feature kind of uh, predominantly in conversations about climate change and sustainability, sustainability, a big kind of uh, a pillar for Long Island wine growing. And so we'll, we'll get into that a bit more. But for uh, the kind of general conversation, we stick to vinifera when we talk about the east end of Long Island. Uh, we've got 53 farms, approximately 2,000 acres under vine. I expect that's higher now. That's going to be our 2011 numbers, probably closer to, to 3,000. I see nods from Russell's. That's, that's about right. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, average growing season, 225 days. And again, a bastion of experimentation. The sheer number of varieties planted and vinified with success in such close proximity is wild. Um, on one of my last visits to the North Fork, I mean, we're talking 30 plus more uh, wine grapes vinified in premium styles available within a 10 mile uh, radius. It's, uh, it's really impressive stuff. So uh, the forks each have their own AVA. Uh, your North Fork of Long Island is protected uh, from the Atlantic Ocean by the South Fork, right? And Peconic Bay, the Peconic Bay in the middle of the two forks. Uh, it's here where the first vineyards were planted in 1973. Uh, and the Hamptons Long Island AVA lies on the South Fork, which has generally less protection from the ocean uh, and therefore fewer vineyards, uh, but a handful more celebrities. So. Uh, <laughs> multiple hands. What's that? Multiple handfuls. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I spend most of my time on the North Fork. Uh, but <laughs> so let's talk a bit about terroir. Uh, climate-wise, the climate of Eastern Long Island is considered mid-latitude maritime. 
grape growing conditions are strongly influenced by the proximity to the ocean, as you can imagine. Uh, Long Island winter temperatures are significantly milder than most of New York State, but they can get cold, you can get some snow. Uh, summers are hot and humid, uh, and also not kind of mentioned here would be uh, hurricane season, which, which can be a factor. Um, just to kind of keep going on that, Long Island features cool, long, uh, I'm sorry, Long Island features long, hot summers with occasional thunderstorms, mild spring and fall seasons, those fall seasons being really beneficial to uh, harvest and extending hang time, uh, and then cool to cold winters with a mix of snow and rain. Uh, precipitation uh, distributed fairly uniformly throughout the year, about three to four inches each month. Um, average yearly snowfall, you know, 20 to 35 inches. Uh, with the North Shore and Western parts averaging uh, slightly more than the South Shore and the East End. Uh, fog will occur, occur on the South Fork when moist, uh, warm Atlantic air is rising up the moraine and encounters cooler air on a lower dew point. Uh, we do, thankfully, uh, from our maritime climate, do see an extended period of frost-free days, uh, a slightly reduced range of diurnal, diurnal and annual temperatures, uh, and a moderately sunny climate. And so uh, degree growing uh, days, we're looking at um, averaging about 3.3 3, 3 thousand annually, which is pretty good for New York State. Uh, Russell, anything else to add on, on climate uh, before I kind of move into a bit more of the geography and then we can kind of do a little recap together? No, I mean, I think you've covered that very, very well. I think climactically, we, we're dramatically influenced by the water. So, yep. so from a latitude standpoint, we're, we're very different to our latitude. Sure. Great. Uh, on the uh, the right hand side of the screen here, we got our geology. The landforms and soils of Long Island were formed by the advances and retreats of glaciers during the Ice Age about twenty one thousand years ago. Same as the rest of the state, uh, although this was the very end of that. Uh, and then the glaciers melted and receded to the north, um, resulting in the difference. Uh, well, if they melted and receded to the north, this is probably actually the first bit that was left. Uh, excuse me. Uh, and then resulting in different between the rocky North Shore and the sandy South Shore. We'll see pictures kind of of the landscape throughout the slides. You're going to see uh, some beaches and things like that included. I always like to think of Long Island as pretty much a giant sand dune. Uh, and so uh, you have there in the bottom your, um, your map, which is showing the Long Island topography, generalized location of the glacial moraines. And so the two great spines of these glacial moraines consisting of gravel and loose rock to the south, um, shape the kind of geomorphical, geomorphological, that's a word. Why did I give myself that word today? Uh, features <laughs> that are relevant to vineyard growing circumstances. Northern Moraine, uh, which directly abuts the North Shore points is known as the Harbor Hill Moraine. The soil here is deep, well draining and ranges from nearly level to gently sloping, medium to moderately textured. Uh, the more southerly moraine known as the Ronkonkoma Moraine, forms the backbone of Long Island. It runs primarily through the very center, roughly coinciding with the length of the Long Island Expressway. Uh, here, the soil is rolling, uh, extremely well draining and coarse textured. So Russell, what do you believe to be the most important driver of terroir in the Long Island wine region? I think you answered that very briefly in saying, obviously our, our, our bodies of water. Can you, can you expand on that for us? Yeah, I mean, the, the two things uh, for sure is, is the water influence and the, the extremely well-drained soils. Um, without either, uh, we wouldn't be talking about vinifera today. Um, so the uh, to our north, obviously, Long Island Sound, Peconic Bay, as you described, we're heavily influenced by uh, the, the effects of water. We're much, we're cooler now than would say New York City, the, so the western end of Long Island, we're probably uh, 10 degrees Fahrenheit cooler because the water's colder. Uh, during the summertime, we're also cooler because the water, although it's warmed up, uh, it's still not as warm as the as the continental temperature would be. And then the flip side happens in the fall. The water's warm, so as the continental temperature is cooling off, we're we're maybe 10 degrees warmer than New York City. So the map shows Connecticut just very very close. As close as that is, our our climate is quite different. They're very much a, connect, a, a continentally affected uh, climate where we're a maritime climate. Um, the soils, as you described, in hey, my joke is uh, that the uh, the North Fork is a, a little bit of um, Hudson Valley topsoil pushed on top of a sandbar uh, hmm. from that that second uh, glacial activity. Extremely well drained soils. Uh, the uh, the topsoil one to two meters is uh, made up of 
anywhere from say 40 to maybe 50%, 60% sand, silt, gravel. Uh, and then as soon as you go down anywhere from um, you know, six, six to eight feet, maybe 10 feet at the absolute most, I don't think I've ever seen a spot that deep, you are in beach sand. Um, so we lose water very, very quickly. Talked about uh, three to four inches through the growing season or throughout the year. Um, so even with that volume of water, most vineyards out here are drip irrigated because uh, we'll have spells of three or four weeks sometimes between rain events. And, and that's what the irrigation is for. So uh, well, very, very, very well drained soils and water influence uh, has made the, the eastern end and especially the North Fork uh, a, a, a very large agricultural community for 300 plus years. Excellent. Fantastic. All right, let's press on. We're going to talk a little bit about viticulture. Um, and so, so Russell, I, we, we see the, the benefits of the well-draining soil. We see the benefits of the maritime climate, and the proximity of the oceans. What are some of the, the pitfalls of, of Long Island region viticulture? And then kind of from there, let's identify them. And then we'll kind of talk about what we do to combat them in terms of uh, how we plant our fruit and how we manage the fruit, things like that. Um, well, they're coupled. Uh, rain and humidity are our, um, our one and two or two and one uh, largest issues. Um, and they're coupled, they're, they're managed the same way in many respects, uh, as you can see with this, this slide, um, we're VSP, so it's a, a vertically shoot position vineyard, um, a, a very, very thin canopy going, going up. Um, the idea of that is to expose all the, the, as many leaves as possible and not have density. Uh, but it allows us to also take away um, uh, leaves in the fruiting zone, open up the, uh, the fruiting zone for light exposure, but also spray penetration and, and, uh, and wind penetration to, to dry out the canopy in the, in the morning, either, either, either after a rain event or even uh, because the dew point was very high that night. So um, we're, a, uh, we're a labor intensive uh, region because of uh, what we're growing, vinifera. Uh, but also to combat that humidity. The, the beauty of um, the water and, and land effect is that there's always a breeze out here. Uh, so that mitigates some of the humidity for sure uh, that, that we're dealing with. Um, it just means very proactive uh, uh, vineyard management and, and spray, spray management, depending on, on uh, not even necessarily the water content of what came from the sky, but how, how humid it has been some, some of the days. We'll have June's a beautiful month, uh, almost never any humidity. July and August will definitely get you know, humid for big chunks of that time. Um, so fungal, fungal pressure is our number one issue. Now, in terms of that, that fungal pressure, and, and, and on my last visit, as you know, I, I spent a day speaking to uh, about two dozen uh, uh, producers and um, you know there are some that are working in their vineyards um, very minimally, uh, organically, uh, even uh, some using biodynamic principles. Um, do you think that that that's the future? Do you think more are going to head that way? Is it is it is the or is the disease pressure that fungal pressure just a bit too great? Is you know what what um, how do we improve in in a viticulture sense? Yeah, you know, organic, not, not, that, not that I'm saying that biodynamics is the only way to improve. I'm just, yeah. uh, you know, in terms of, of, of impact, you know, what yes, are we, what can we be doing better? Organic is extremely difficult. I don't know that that's uh, the future for the island. Uh, sustainable, sustainable practices is very much uh, the current and the future of the island for sure. Um, for a couple of reasons. Um, and I'll start going back to the soil, because we're extremely well drained, anything that we put on the ground or on the vines or um, will leach. Um, and so um, the concept of, of, of farming out here, but obviously the sustainability of the vineyards is to be very, very proactive of not putting anything into the groundwater. Uh, and so vineyards have been um, the poster child uh, for, of, the, of the DEC from test wells uh, over the last 30 plus years uh, by, by our practices. We, we, we have recyclable, recyclable sprayers. So although we're putting out a volume, we're, we're catching and, and reusing over 90% of that. So um, the volume of, of whatever we're spraying is, is minimized tremendously. Um, 
and also because of the canopy, the the quantity that you that you need to to use is is very much a part of it. So sustainability is has been a part of uh, Long Island for for many many years, and it's it's growing for sure. More and more people are uh, focusing on on that, and it, that's that's expanding. It's 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 what it's what's critical for our area. Some of the some of the older uh, agricultural activities out here were a little bit more harmful uh, for the uh, groundwater. So that's not what we're about. Excellent. Uh, and it's not all, it's not all, it, it sounds like a lot of work, really. <laughs> uh, you know, but I, I do think, and I think the proof is is in the pudding when we when we taste the wines, um, and it has been, you know, that that's been my experience. It's it's worth it. Right. This is a is a pretty special place for for viticulture, um, and I remember it was um, Adam from Coffee Pot Cellars, you know, noted that that it's one of the last agricultural regions in the you know tri-state metro area, really, where where agriculture is the uh, driving force behind the North Fork, and that's that's pretty special. Um, I guess. No, people who haven't come what's, to what's gets you out of bed every day i guess maybe maybe is the the kind of broad question you know you know um years and years ago uh, i worked in burgundy as an intern for a harvest uh, in my early years um and we've traveled extensively my wife and i uh, through uh, uh well traveled in general but traveled through a lot of wide regions and around the world and to me, there's, there's there's two types of wineries now. Uh, it used to be old world, new world. Now it's cold, cool climate, warm climate. Um, and in most cool climates, you're dealing with a lot of the a lot of the issues that we're dealing with here. Uh, rain is is, is definitely a, a connecting theme. Uh, Burgundy for sure sees that. Uh, Champagne, number of other areas uh, see that. So, but and not knocking warm climate, but the the consistency of warm climate wines is 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 probably stronger than cool climate wines. Sure. But but the the highs and the lows, you know, don't differ. In mm -hmm. cool climate wines, the highs, uh, to, in my opinion, go much higher. The lows can go much lower. Um, and so, the, to try to to take advantage or try to maximize the highs as much as possible. Um, that's that's definitely my driver. I'm I'm very much connected with the vineyards, uh, even though you know people think all oh, winemakers just purely are in, in the cellar, you know, tasting wines all day long. Uh, I, uh, it, at small wineries, you have to be very connected with your vineyard, um, so um, and stay on top of all all the activities and in a very very timely manner. So I work very very closely, um, weekly, daily. Uh, during harvest with the, the vineyard manager to leave. Right. Uh, and tell me a bit about um, a vintage variation uh, in, in the sense, um, oh yeah, what, what do you, what comes to mind when I say vintage variation? Again, you know, um, I, I appreciate vintage variation. Again, I think when you're, when you're talking about cool climate regions, as you said, the highs are highs, the lows are lows. That that to me says there's vintage variation. Um, do you think that Long Island does a great does a good job of of, of capturing that? I do. Um, Thirty years when I first came here, uh, I think out of a decade you got maybe two great years, uh, three two or three off years, um, and then obviously the, the balance. Uh, I think because of our our improved viticultural techniques. Uh, age of vines, a number of other other factors, um, climate change. Uh, um, we're probably getting three great years out of 10 uh, and, and maybe have minimized the to maybe one off year out of 10 uh, and then six very, you know, at normal years. So I think the um, we've somewhat we've somewhat taken the we, we've risen the, the bottom bar up. Uh, the, uh, the top bar hopefully continues to go very high. I think that's it's something that's very enjoyable. That's that's another thing, obviously, that gets me out of bed. Um, how how do you how do you adapt to that? Um, so we'll have we'll have some great red years sometimes, and some very very good to great white years. Mm -hmm. And in between, there there is some you know there, there's a combination of both a, a very good you know uh, white and a red year. So those are the those are the ones that really uh, uh, interest me the most. Twenty two was one of those, um, okay. and that's. That's from uh, 
the, 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 the end of the season, September into early October, somewhat cooling off, but staying very moderate. Um, yep. So the, the vintage variations are, I think, are critical for the winemaker. You can't make the you can't make the the same wine year after year exactly the same. You have to adjust, um, and that's stimulating. Um, in a warmer climate, um, not knocking them, but there's less adjustment. So it's a little little bit more. Um, this is how we do it every year. Scenario uh, mm -hmm. where cool climate winemakers would not say that. Right. Good. Um, I had something else I was going to say and I lost it. So we're going to move on uh, into our history slide. I'm sure it's going to pop back in, uh, but we'll talk a little bit about the beginnings here. Uh, and, you know, in, in the, uh, the reference guide that we, we published, um, we said that early wine growing attempts on Long Island follow a well-known mantra. If you at first don't succeed, try, try again. Uh, and we're going back a few hundred years, right, where it's always been agricultural. Uh, there's always been, up until really the last half century, uh, uh, trouble with, with vinifera vines. And so that's largely a, an America's problem, an East Coast problem. But um, there has been some attempts, right? And so going back to the 1820s, uh, Alphonse Lubat from France established a 40-acre vineyard in Brooklyn, or what is now Brooklyn, and um, his vineyard efforts succumbed to disease pressure. Uh, Alden Spooner also attempted vinifera in Brooklyn. We got 1827, uh, but decided that native were the only viable options and planted Isabella. Uh, the Prince family operated a nursery and botanical gardens in Flushing, now Queens, uh, with some success. Uh, and their 1830 catalog lists native and vinifera grapes. Uh, and then Moses Fournier, a French immigrant, introduced wine grapes to Eastern Long Island in the 18th century. Uh, and by the 20th century, small back backyard vineyards flourished, uh, providing wine for private consumption. Uh, but commercial grapes didn't really take off until the mid 1900s. Uh, and so we, we know that the first vineyard was planted, the first uh, commercial uh, vinifera vineyard was planted uh, in the east end of Long Island in 1973, Louisa and, and Alex Hargrave. I had the pleasure of meeting Louisa uh, earlier this year, and, and she was an absolute delight uh, to, to chat with. But I, I do wonder, I wonder why it didn't happen earlier, right? There were, there was a lot of experimentation coming down the pipe in the 50s and 60s. Uh, in other parts of New York, you know, um, where where Hudson Valley kind of picked up right after Prohibition, Long, uh, Finger Lakes picked up right after Prohibition, but it, it took uh, Long Island just a, just a touch longer. And do you think it was it was just waiting to see? Was it just was it just watching the other regions to see how things were, were going about before before someone um, had the the chutzpah uh, uh, to, to plant? Um, and I mean, it, it seems like, you know, Louisa described it as a risk. And I actually think that, that um, I mean, thank goodness she did. Here we are 50 years later. Um, uh, you know, they planted the first vine. Uh, they, they've, they've, we now have a very, uh, uh, gosh, my words today, had a very robust uh, industry. You know, first South Fork Vineyards uh, planted in 1979. I don't, I don't know if there was a question in there, Russell. Uh, it was more just me kind of uh, uh, curious. Um, yeah. No, I think I think um, if I was to if I was to if I was to think of why um, I think this area was such a strong agricultural area, uh, almost every plantable acre was planted to something uh, for hundreds of years. It was a very very strong potato farm uh, area. There was there was over eighty thousand acres of, of potato farms on the east end of Long Island. Uh, so it, um, there was you know a lot of uh, fruit farms, a uh, lot, lot, lot of agricultural activity out here. So um, I think some of the areas, you know, I, I don't know enough. I mean, I know enough about the Hudson Valley and obviously the Finger Lakes been there many times, um, but possibly the availability of land was different. Uh, the proximity to the city or it was slightly different. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think it was because of the the farmers weren't looking for an, uh, a, a, mm -hmm. another crop to plant out here. Mm -hmm. So it took uh, it took a little while for someone coming in from the outside to think about that. And I think one of the drivers of, uh, uh, of the Hargraves is a, a very, very old farming family out here called the Wickhams uh, um, had planted vinifera eating grapes, table grapes um, in the fifties. And, and that was one of the, the, the reasons that attracted Louisa and Alex to the area saying, hmm, these, they're not wine grapes, but uh, they're vinifera. And, and 20 years later, they're still, still viable. It, this area must be possible. 
Awesome. Uh, and a lot of uh, wonderful things has happened have happened since, uh, including uh, what we have on the slide. Uh, uh, Long Island Merlot from Bedell Sellers took center stage at the 2013 inaugural luncheon of President Barack, Barack Obama's second term, along with a Riesling from the Finger Lakes. Uh, and then uh, the last 30 years have witnessed the establishment of such game-changing organizations like Cornell's uh, uh, Long Island Horticultural Research and Extension Center. It's in Riverhead, established in 1993. Uh, and the research program has evaluated some 50 grape varieties uh, with an emphasis on clones of the commercially significant varieties of Chardonnay, Merlot, and Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, and, you know, generally the, um, the Cornell Extension Centers throughout the state, uh, their impact can't be um, uh, kind of downplayed. It's, it's uh it's, it's really fantastic to have them there doing the research. And so uh, we also introduced Long Island's uh, Sustainable Wine Growing Certification. Uh, and I've got that uh, a bit later for us uh, as we kind of finish with some sustainability notes. Uh, we have Premium Wine Group's Custom Crush Facility, which uh, I believe you know something uh, about, Russell. Uh, and so why don't you tell us about, the, about that? Because our first wine is from Sparkling Point. We could talk a little bit about their impact. Um, but... Uh, you know, I think that that having a, a custom crush facility has has introduced so much um, potential and so many uh, uh, eager uh, brands. You know, as we know, the land is is hard to come by out there, but uh, and and so is equipment. And so, um, you know, what kind of drove the creation of the Premium Wine Group, and and um, uh, and what's what's the what's the future look like? Yeah, the um, um, in the early nineties. Uh, there was there was an influx of um, uh, I think uh, winemakers and viticulturalists uh, were brought in by uh, some of the early wineries. Uh, uh, myself, um, you know, uh, Roman Roth over at, at uh, Wolfer Estates. We're tasting one of their wines today. Uh, Gilles Martin. We're tasting obviously another one of his wines. And there was other other people that came into the area and brought in different perspectives. Uh, and so I, I think our viticultural practices changed in the early 90s uh, to that VSP system and a number of other things. So then 90, 91, 93, 94, 95, we had some excellent years. Uh, um, and that was the beginning of the Long Island being discovered. Um, all of a sudden, um, prior to that, some nice white wines were being made. Um, and definitely but, uh, Kip Bedell was making some... You know, the, the best red wines out here in the in the 80s that was one of the reasons attracted um, myself and my wife to the area some of his his wines um but i think in the early 90s mid 90s when those red wines came out 95 96 um wine spectator new york times some other critically acclaimed uh, um, uh, magazines said oh long island's arrived here's some here's some good wines uh, that attracted a lot of interest to our wines from a sales standpoint, but that also attracted a lot of interest from uh, people planting and investing in the area. So I think in 90, there was 600 acres uh, planted. Uh, by 2000, there was over, there was 2000 acres planted. So there was this, there was this bubble of interest and there was this bubble of uh, a lot of vineyards coming online uh, in, in a short period of time. So I luckily thought of the, the concept of bringing a, a custom cr uh, crushed you know, winery to the to the area. We were built in. Um, we start we started in two thousand. Um, had I had two partners. Uh, I was the founding partner, but I had two partners involved with Premium Wine Group. Uh, Mark Lieb, Lieb Lieb Vineyards that we're going to be also trying today, uh, and uh, another good friend, Bernie Sussman. Uh, the three of us formed. Uh, I was the active partner, but the three of us formed Premium Wine Group, and the concept was to offer space equipment and personnel for a number of smaller producers uh, to make wine without the huge investment of, you know, the capital investment of equipment that, that a small producer doesn't use very often. Um, so um, from first year, there was, um, we had seven producers here that made wines uh, individually, but in the same facility. Um, we have six, over 16 wineries now um, making wines at premium wine group. So um, the, the concept is, is an affordable way of making smaller volumes of wine but also a, a quality way because we're pretty large collectively we're 100 and over 160,000 cases now uh, from last harvest um, and so we're able to premium wine groups able to uh, uh, buy equipment that 
and offer equipment services, you know, cross-flow filtration devices, things like this, that small wineries could never justify. Um, so a small producer making 3,000 cases, 5,000 cases, 7,000, whatever the number is, um, would need to buy their own crusher, their own press. I mean, the, the capital expense and the payback of that is, is enormous. Um, uh, this, allows, this allows a lot more um, uh, experimentations. And, and actually the first wine that we are going to try, Sparkling Point, uh, made their first seven vintages at Premium Wine Group, uh, establishing their inventory, establishing the confidence in their in their their wine brand. So it allows not only long term small producers to stay, but also producers to grow and eventually build their own facility. Excellent. Uh, well, yeah, we're we're happy to have you. It's uh, it's um, uh, it's yeah, it's added so much you know more more personality to the market for for Long Island wines. Uh, I don't think that that um, impact can be, uh, you know, uh, uh, ignored. Uh, and so, um, one last I point that, I was, go ahead, please. Sorry, I could just one. Uh, I think one last point that um, I think it brings it. It says it says a confidence of growth uh, for an area for for this because the custom crush facility is always based on volume in many respects. Um, one of the beauties of of the North Fork where you initially started is is where this small east to west in north to south region. So the wineries are very, very close. The vineyards are very, very close. So a custom crush facility is, is much easier um, uh, here than it would be say in Virginia um, where the vineyards are much wider spread. Yep, great. Uh, before we move into our flight, um, I remembered what I was going to say or I was going to ask. And you had mentioned that um, when you have that kind of extended fall season, you're kind of going into mid-October. What is your kind of general harvest schedule? When are you starting? When are you ending? You know, I don't know it varies, but kind of when are you looking to bring in bring in certain things uh, throughout the the season? Yeah, sparkling fruit um, starts maybe the first, but definitely the second week of September. Okay. Um, some of the early whites are are coming in beginning the, the third, end of the third, into the, the, the fourth week. Uh, Chardonnay is definitely starting the end of September into the, into the beginning of October. Uh, Reds, Merlot, Cab Franc are the two largest uh, uh, ones planted here. They're more, they're more in very warm years, maybe the second week of October, but typically the, the third week of October. Okay. Some, of the later, some of the later varieties, Cabernet Sauvignon, Petit Verdot, um, are into the first week of November normally. Uh, we've we've harvested as late into, as the second week of November. Um, where so so fall frosts do happen, uh, but are also pushed back because of the warmth of the of the of the uh, the surrounding water. Yeah. So it sounds like a pretty long harvest season, kind of comparably. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that's a that's a great benefit for. Being able to pivot, I mean, we talk about kind of our, our diversity being our strength. And, and when we look at this flight, you're going to see sparkling wine, you're going to see rosé. And those are two kind of big opportunities for, for pivots based on how your fruit is doing on any certain, any given vintage. And that long harvest season is giving producers an opportunity to make decisions to go another way where where maybe your Cab Franc isn't, uh, isn't fully fledged red or there's a weather event that's not going to get you into uh, late October, then man makes a damn good rosé right <laughs> I, I i would agree i would good. agree uh fantastic and then just um when are you guys generally seeing bud breaks bud breaks could normally the last couple of days of april but into the first few days of may you know um, um this year was, was was much earlier than normal we broke uh, i think uh, may 18th 19th uh which is rare um uh, sorry april 18th 19th um but it's normally within that, you know, 20, 28 through May 5th period. So we are delayed, which, which, which pushes off the, the, the possibility of spring frost. Yeah. When I, uh, when I spoke with everyone, I was there the first week of April and some were like, yeah, I think, think bud breaks happen in, uh, you know, maybe next week. And then I'd mention that to another winemaker and they'd be like, hold your tongue. <laughs> yes, we don't, we don't. We don't want to break early. Uh, yeah. That that is. being said, uh, probably the best red vintage we've had uh, was 2013, and and that was the earliest bud break that we've ever had. But for 
for two weeks, we, we were all watching the weather forecast very, very, you know, uh, you know, carefully because we danced around frost, uh, you know, two or three times uh, in that two-week period. So, uh, and I would pref I would prefer to break in the first few days of May every year. Right. And you guys weren't uh, particularly affected by the the big frost event that happened mid month in in May, yeah? No, luck luckily we were uh, uh, we got to thirty eight degrees, uh, which for then is extremely cold for us, um, but no 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 risks, no no yeah. problems. Fantastic. Sorry Let's for our neighbors, sorry for our neighbors, but uh, yeah. for uh, outside the region, but within the region, not an issue. Great. All right, let's taste some wine. We're gonna start with our uh, sparkling wine here. Uh, and so we have the Sparkling Point Brut uh, Natur, 68% uh, Pinot Noir, 32% Chardonnay. It's a non-vintage wine. However, the bottle I have here uh, is mostly 2018 fruit, uh, with then uh, uh, supplemented with aged reserve wines. Um, we have zero dosage, and three plus years on the lees. Uh, it was disgorged in November of 2022. Uh, and so you're looking 19, 20, 21. Yeah, you're looking um, uh, over over 30 months for sure. Uh, 36 months for sure. Uh, and Sparkling Point is uh, a method Champenoise house, which is, is unique um, and uh, was a big investment. And that investment... Uh, uh, made a big splash uh, in terms of Long Island sparkling wine and and drove a lot of interest uh, and and kind of solidified this as a as a region for uh, great bubbles. And so the, the 2010 marked the completion of Sparkling Point's uh, state-of-the-art method Champenois winemaking facility after their first, again, seven vintages with Premium Wine Group. Uh, they're in South Hold on the North Fork. Uh, and the dedication, commitment, investment to the craft in the region, uh, as I said, garnered much deserved attention putting Long Island on the map for quality sparkling wine. Uh, French-born Sparkling Point winemaker uh, Gilles Martin uh, boasts over three decades of experience in France, Germany, and California, and he chose down to put roots, uh, uh, pun intended, into New York State and has launched winemaking programs at many of Long Island's uh, established wineries. Uh, he was also a pleasure to chat with as well. And so, uh, yeah, a little, I, I like uh, when when the bubbles are, are heavy, Pinot Noir is a personal preference. And so I'm excited to try this one. Um, we've seen their sparkling wines in other sessions, um, particularly the sparkling wine session that we did. And so I wanted to do something different. I believe that was the Blanc de Blanc. And so we've got the Brutnay Tour here. Uh, I love that um, that kind of zero dosage, high acid style. And so, yeah, lovely nose. Yeah, I mean the 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 yeasty kind of brioche is there, but it's not heavy. Um, I don't think we're doing anything uh, kind of barrel related here with this wine, and so it really is just kind of fresh, bright. Get a bit of confectionery um, uh, spices, and then just really bright fruit, white flowers. Mm. Lovely texture on the palate. Mousse is really nice. Hits, hits every corner of your mouth, um, which is is really uh, uh, quite quite fun, and um, yeah, the acid's high, it's bright, it's lifted, like really driving up, which is great. Driving through the palate, long finish, still still tasting and enjoying this wine. Um, yeah, what do you think, Russ? Yeah, no, Gilles is a very talented uh, sparkling producer. Um, he has a history in Rotterdam Estates and. But, you know, both France and California, so uh, he knows his way around sparkling wine. Um, no, it's, I think it's everything you said. Uh, I think um, sparkling Method Champenoir is, uh, is uh, well suited to New York uh, and, and also very well suited to here. We can, we can adjust picking times um, depending on the year, a little bit earlier in a warm year, a little bit later in a cool year. Um, but even, even in a warm year, it's, the acidity really comes through very nicely, and that's critical when it comes to sparkling wine. This is a light, delicate, you know, uh, 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 nice acidity, refreshing wine. That's that's perfect. Uh, cool, cool climates can do this. Uh, you know, I know in Australia, uh, way back when, they, we struggled with trying to make you know bubbles in on the mainland of, of Australia. It's, it's it's near impossible. It's just too hot. If you look at Australian uh, sparkling wine, they're almost all coming from Tasmania, yep. and yeah. so. 
the same in, in the US, they're all coming from the cooler regions uh, uh, versus the warmer regions and Sparkling Point does a, a wonderful job. Yeah, because you really do need to get your kind of phenolic ripeness, even though you want to pick them early, they've got to get to a certain point where you're getting flavor, right? Yeah. Um, and what's nice is, is those kind of cooler, moderate climates can really kind of get you there um, in, a, in, a, in a better way, honestly. Um, otherwise, there's just not enough time. And yeah. so um, in terms of sparkling wine, I mean, um, there's there's a lot going on on Long Island right now. Um, you've also got some pet nat specialists out there doing method ancestral. Um, we saw during the sparkling session a video from Christopher Tracy, winemaker at, at Channing Daughters. <laughs> who basically said they've leaned into Method Ancestral um, uh, because <laughs> Method Champenoise takes up a lot of space. <laughs> and so um, what do you what do you think the, the trends, what are you seeing as trends in terms of bubbles? Um, is, is anyone doing any any kind of forced carbonated uh, uh, sparklings or is it really all either kind of traditional method and uh, um, uh, Method Ancestral? Are there, are there, are there Charmant methods uh, happening? What are we? What should we kind of look out for? Yeah, there are there are a couple of producers that are uh, in the forced carbonation, um, mm -hmm. sparkling, uh, for I think for that exact reason, time and, and space. Mm -hmm. um, Method Champenois obviously takes a larger commitment of of, of both, um, so um, uh, that's and that's not necessarily for everyone because it's reflected in the in the price point of the bottle. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's I think there's space for the whole spectrum. Um, a lot of the pet nets are obviously a, a much quicker to market and uh, sort of, uh, I don't want to make it sound you know, simple, but a little, little bit more fun and uh, uh, approachable, uh, yep. where obviously the sparklings are, you know, uh, a little bit more, definitely more serious. And um, But, I, you know, I, I would like to leave everyone's uh, with the impression sparkling wine is not for celebrations only. Uh, sparkling wine could be for t Tuesday night uh, or Wednesday night. It doesn't have to be uh, necessarily a birthday or an anniversary. So I think it's just a, it's a style that America, Americans have, have started to embrace over the last 20 plus years. Yeah. Uh, it's not something that, that happened as, as a new country. You know, mm -hmm. America was a relatively new wine consuming country. And I think there's lots of growth in sparkling wine. I think it's definitely strong for our area. Um, and um, I think the, the negative of Method Champenois is obviously somewhat of the, of the equipment as well. Um, mm -hmm. So a, a winery like Sparkling Point has, has gone all in on sparkling wine. Um, so hence they make, they make some of the, the best ones out here because of their vineyard, their winemaker, their, their winemaking you know, uh, equipment. Uh, mm -hmm. So that limits some wineries. Um, at Premium Wine Group, we have Method Champenois equipment as I, I mean, you know, riddling machines and uh, the scourging machines. So several of our producers here make Method Champenoir as well. So that's right, one, right. Of the one of the restrictions, but that's, uh, I think that's changing. Good. Uh, and I think, yeah, I also think that, you know, the style works very well for, for the community too. You've got beaches, you've got boating, you know, just that lifestyle Hamptons, right? I mean, let's pop some bottles. <laughs> I yes. think that's great. Pop, pop uh, and some bottles with lower alcohol. Sure, yeah, even better, right? Even better. Um, and I think from a pairing perspective, uh, sparkling wines are just fantastic and they're not just for pre-meal. I think um, I'm, I am all for bubbles all the way throughout the meal, um, even with, with proteins um, and, and even richer proteins too, beef, beef dishes, steaks, grilled grilled meats. Uh, I think um, sparkling wines, particularly traditional method, are just, just uh, lovely. Uh, so let's press on. We're going to go into our white wine. Uh, I'm trying to keep an eye on the clock. I know it's not my strong suit, folks. I apologize. Uh, but we are going to Wolfer Estate. Uh, we are doing the uh, Antonov Sauvignon Blanc 2021. There we are. Uh, and this is 100% Sauvignon Blanc. We've got 13.2% alcohol. Uh, and... Uh, let's see. So this is 100% Sauvignon Blanc, predominantly the Mousquet clone. Uh, and then I've got their tech notes as well, which I'm just going to, I'll read a little bit from uh, as we taste. And okay. There's a bit of technical data. I mean, it's a dry wine, residual sugar is 0.4 uh, grams per liter. Um, 
handpicked on September 27th. So this was kind of a bunch select. They picked just kind of their best blocks, best fruit uh, for the Antonovich, their kind of white horse label, their higher uh, uh, kind of echelon of wines uh, and gentle press, cool fermentation, and then fermented in a 500 liter uh, uh, three-year-old French oak puncheon, complete to dryness. Uh, I'm sorry, only 7% of the wine was fermented in a 500 liter uh, French oak puncheon. So a bit of complexity there from the oak. Uh, great. And then uh, stayed in barrel for 5.5 months, Sir Lee. Uh, and the wine that was in the tank, racked after 22 days. And then again, five and a half months on the fine lees. Malolactic fermentation completely avoided. So no mallow here. Uh, we're just looking for vibrant food forward character and then blended and filtered only about a thousand cases. Uh, and yeah, Wolfers, they're, they're trendsetters, man. They, um, they have a wonderful rosé program that's gotten them quite a bit of attention. Uh, they're, I mean, honestly, they've outgrown what they can produce. They're, they're bringing in rosé from Provence these days with the, uh, their partnership with their, their kind of uh, summer in a bottle uh, rosés, which is great. Uh, but I wanted to show Sauv Blanc. I think it's a great grape for, for the region. Um, and uh, we've tasted some Chardonnays kind of throughout. Uh, and so I wanted to do something a little different. And it's a lovely wine. I mean, it's more, more kind of Loire, Sancerre for me than it is than it is New Zealand. Um, I mean, we're, you know, the pyrazines are, are there, but very, very approachable, very, um, very balanced. Really just nice tropical fruit on the nose. What do you think? Yeah, I, I, I agree. I agree. I think um, uh, I think you, you brought up a very good starting point. You know, Loire and New Zealand. You know, I think we're in between. Uh, mm -hmm. We have some of the you know nice aromatics of the of the New Zealand style. A little bit also a little bit more structure from the you know the Loire style. So this definitely leans there to towards the uh, the far end. The 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 aromatics are very nice. Um, uh, texture is very nice. Uh, definitely coming from the um, uh, from the that surly uh, uh, extended time, um, the uh, that musk musk clone has this sort of a almost a, um, a grapefruit skin, grapefruit yeah. rind characteristic that uh, I I particularly particularly like in Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, it's a variety that uh, I like as a consumer. It, it, um, it's it's a variety that's growing in 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 production, you know, pretty rapidly on Long Island. So uh, 30 years ago, there was a, a little bit planted. Now there's, there's more and more of it. And, and uh, there's, there's been some new plantings in, over the last couple of years because people are feeling very confident that it's a variety for the future. And I think this shows, this shows uh, you know, definitely richness possibilities as well. Mm -hmm. Very good. Mm. Yeah, very, very nice wine. Uh, are there any other kind of varietal uh, trends that you're seeing uh, that maybe you'd want to share? Hmm. Just because our vineyard data is is uh, uh, woefully uh, overdue, and so uh, you're you're you know boots on the ground for us. Yeah, um, Leibs Leibs uh, produced the uh, Pinot Pinot Blanc for you know since their beginning. Uh, mm -hmm. their, their, their Pinot Blanc was planted in '83. Pinot, uh, Lieb and Palmer were pretty well the only two producers of uh, Pinot Blanc for decades, um, which somewhat surprised me because uh, it's Lieb's it's Lieb's number one variety. Um, uh, it's 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 hallmark. They make a method Champenoise out of it, a table wine. Um, there's been you know more and more planting of Pinot Blanc as well. So I think there's five or six, maybe seven producers of, of Pinot Blanc now. So that's growing. Um, both. Uh, Pinot Gris, uh, Pinot Grigio, um, sort of more stylistic from the same same grape, um, sure. is is starting to grow also. So um, we're, we're we're paying attention to some of the reds uh, as well. But I think we're, we're sort of in the white world here with these tastings. So mm -hmm. I think some of those uh, lighter um, styled white wines uh, are are growing. Mm -hmm. You know, we obviously have still the largest planted variety out here. White variety is Chardonnay. And people are focusing still on Chardonnay, but mm -hmm. it's not necessarily the growth uh, variety that, that yeah. we're seeing. A uh, little bit of Albarino is being planted. So I think That's smart. It's yeah. definitely on the on that lighter, brighter style um, mm -hmm. varieties that are that are growing for sure. Mm -hmm. so. 
Yeah, very cool stuff. I tasted some Oxara and some Melon de Bourgogne, uh, two, two whites that really uh, jumped out at me um, on that last visit. I mean, um, I, I've, I've said it before, but that Melon de Bourgogne, that's like Hampton's Muscadet. It's, it's you know, take my money. Uh, and so, um, fantastic. Let's press on just in the interest of time, because uh, I want to give you an opportunity for your wine, of course. If, if, I, uh, if I could sort of maybe give one little point, more point, um, of course. I think that also shows confidence in a region. When you first when you first establish yourself, you don't plant I, I won't say off the wall varieties or, or less known varieties. You plant all the all the known, the Chardonnay, the Merlot, the Cabernet, you know those. And so now I think you, we've got to this confidence level that we're saying no, no, no. I think we can we can go this way or we can go that way. Uh, I know we can do it well, and I think we have enough uh, public awareness that they will trust us. Yeah. Yep, and that's a good place to be, without a doubt. Uh, let's move into some Cabernet Franc. We've got the uh, Channing Daughters uh, Rosado of the Cabernet Franc, 2020 vintage, 12.5% ABV. I couldn't find much uh, in terms of tech notes, um, and I, I only reached out in the 25th hour uh, uh, to see um, if they um, had anything on the tip of their tongue. But, um, you know, Channing Daughters is a, uh, a rosé house, I think, um, between, I don't know which they make more of rosé or, or pet mat in terms of number of, of styles, but they're often doing them uh, as single varieties, uh, particularly with the rosés. And it's an exciting program to kind of go through and try a risotto of Cabernet Franc, of Merlot, of Toraldigo, of Lagrine, of... Uh, of, you know, uh, I'd probably do a Cabernet. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. And, um, you know, again, it, it plays so well with the local crowd, with the local vibe of the East End of Long Island. I think it's an incredibly smart play. Um, and Cabernet Franc is growing in importance in terms of a, of a red grape variety. Um, and, you know, I, I've said this before, I'm being uh, the humble opinion that, that Cabernet Franc is quite possibly the best red grape to unite the major regions of New York state. Um, not that we necessarily need to, but, um, you know, from, uh, a marketing storytelling perspective. Um, tell me about uh, Cap Franc on Long Island. Yeah. Um, so Merlot is the, the number one planted red. Um, mm -hmm. Cabernet Franc would be the, would be the second planted red. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, it produces some beautiful wines. Uh, obviously you're starting with Rosé, but, all the way through into into standalone varietal as and blends. Um, I think it's a it, it's a, it is also a rapidly growing uh, variety out here. Uh, there's been you know some nice plantings of Cabernet Franc. It's a little fickle. It's a little fickle in the vineyard. Well, I do agree that it's a, it's, a, it's potentially the state red. I think it grows well up in the Finger Lakes, in the Hudson Valley, and out here. Um, the beauty of the beauty and the negative of Cabernet Franc is it doesn't grow very well in many parts of the world. Um, so um, you will never see this mass marketed Cab, Cab Franc, um, uh, which I think is a good thing for, for us. Um, you never say, you never see, well, I won't say it, what I normally say, um, but it's a little bit harder in the, in the, in the vineyard to grow. It's uh, it wants to crop more than it should. Uh, so you have to be really on top of uh, your viticultural practices. If you are, it produces beautiful wines. Um, Merlot, to me, the, high, uh, the variation between wineries is much smaller. Uh, mm. Cabernet Franc is it's it's much much higher, uh, less because of winemaking, more because of the viticultural uh, sure. side of the variety. It, it can and, go and from this really way. that's where you're managing those those pyrazines. Huh? Yes, yeah. yes. It can go from if you miss a little bit uh, on Merlot, it's 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 there, but but it's not as obvious. If you miss from a crop yield or, or leaf removal or a number of different things, uh, Cabernet Franc moves from this you know beautiful red fruit to uh, raspberry, nice fine tannin wine to much more vegetative, much more hot, you know pyrazine driven, uh, herbal you know negative characteristics. So. Mm -hmm. It's it it sh it shows it shows um, the technique in the vineyard very very you know very very obviously. Yeah, and and I always yeah I'm always looking for just that little bit of, of varietal typicity to remind me that it is in fact Cabernet Franc. I think this has 
this rosé has that i think it's got it on the aromatics and it's got it a bit on the finish too which is just enough uh really really well balanced uh texturally very plush rosé uh um it's it's quite enjoyable um the uk importer here of this wine of channing daughters uh they build this as the uh what they believe to be the best rosé in the united states which is pretty cool uh, and so uh, this is this is a, a one that I always have around, uh, and it's one of the few um, uh, producers that has a UK representation here as well. And so it's something we're working on, uh, but um, I'm I'm happy to have them around for sure. Yeah. Uh, Russell, Cabernet Franc Frank and Rosé, Cabernet Franc and Rosé also, um, Cabernet Sauvignon, for instance, in Rosé, in my opinion, uh, has just that little bit more astringency or and and some 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 negatives coming through where Cabernet Franc. The, the softness, the elegance uh, shows out. It's, it's, yeah. doesn't it doesn't. Cabernet Sauvignon generally just, you know, rougher edges, you know, but a bit sharper, uh, sharper uh, points, you know? Yeah. And so that's, that makes it a little tricky for, for Rose for sure. I think they still, I think they make one at, um, at, uh, at Channing Daughters, though. I'd be curious to, to try it. They make like 12 every year. It's crazy. Uh, so I want to hand it over to you for our final wine, uh, the sellers, uh, Lieb Sellers Meritage. Uh, 2020, 13.2% uh, ABV, 10 months in Hungarian oak, and a blend led by Merlot. Uh, over to you. Yeah, the um, um, do merit. I guess I always go back to the beginning. Um, Robert Mandavi, you know, was it was one of the made started fine wine consumption in America from from a from domestic production and. Uh, and obviously is a, a huge leader in, in the industry. Um, at the beginning, the goal with uh, Mandabi said, I'm going to make 100% Cabernet Sauvignon. I'm going to make 100% you know, Chardonnay and Sauvignon Blanc, and I'm going to put the variety on the on the bottle. That's going to separate me from what was on the market in, in the 60s and the 70s, which were European wines, uh, you know, Burgundy and, you know, a number of so non-varietal labeled wines. So America got into the, uh, the belief that... Uh, Varietal wines, hundred percent, were the best, um, and and there are some varieties that, that that's still true to this day. Uh, but I think for me at least, blending is is is, is always critical, especially in in red wine. Uh, and my roots in Australia, we were the same way. It was bin bin sixty seven or bin thirty eight, or it was never the variety. Um, when Australia got into the export market, it needed to be varietally labeled. So, um, meritage wines allow you to from a winemaking standpoint, to try to sculpt uh, the, a style of wine that is much more repeatable over that 10 year period um, by using different varieties. So uh, in, a, in a warmer year, the Cabernet Sauvignon would be a much higher percentage um, in, this, in this blend. Um, uh, in a, you know, 20 was a very strong year, but not one of the, one of the hottest years. Mm -hmm. uh, so you could see a very heavy uh, influence of Merlot. This is probably the, the most heavily influenced uh, meritage that I've done for several years. So uh, it might be more in that 50% range and Cabernet Sauvignon up maybe 30 or 40%. So the um, in hotter, hotter years, Cabernet Sauvignon would go up and Petit Pado, you know, would go up. In cooler years, it, it, it goes the opposite. But the goal is to try to make a very consistent style uh, from a mouthfeel and, and a tannin structure. Yeah varietals change obviously the Cabernet Franc is very aromatic and very upfront not not a lot of tannin on the finish Cabernet Sauvignon is the opposite uh, Petit Verdot is sort of that same way Merlot is much more mid palate um, so from a blending standpoint it's it's, um, it's the most rewarding wine that I that I think I make for sure because it's all about what what I think is the best blend um, when you're making a varietal Merlot which still may get some, you know, 10, 5%, 3% of this or 2% of that, um, but you're still limited because it cannot be more than 25% of other other grapes, where, as you see in this blend, it can be whatever whatever tastes best. Uh, everyone sort of says, oh, how do you get to that kind of, uh, uh, how do you get to that blend at the end of the year? Um, Every variety is kept separate in, in, the, in the cellar. Uh, we mm -hmm. ferment Merlot by itself. Uh, we have several blocks of Merlot, several clones of Merlot. They're all kept separate. Um, Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, they're all fermented separate, barrel uh, uh, separate until 
literally now, May, June of, the, of that following year, then the, the blending is, 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 is put together. Uh, and it's just purely blending trials. It's, it's putting a whole bunch of beakers on the table and, and trying you know 20% of this, 15% of that. Uh, and uh, um, that's, the, that's the job that people think winemakers do all the time. Uh, but it's but it's uh, it's a very rewarding side side. So it's blended uh, mid year. It's put typically back into barrel to to, to, to for the varietals to come together. Oh, nice, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, and uh, and then one last little look prior to bottling, maybe making some additional adjustments. And we try to you know have some good bottle age before we release the wines as well. So um, it's our flagship red. Um, mm -hmm. um, I enjoy making all of them, um, but uh, this one's this one's a little bit more rewarding. Good. Uh, there is a, a comparison often made between Long Island and Bordeaux. Uh, how does the Long Island wine community actually feel about that? Um, is, is is it a good comparison? Is it is it an old comparison? Is it is it you know? Um. I mean, we are a maritime climate, so hence this, that's a similarity. And from a latitude standpoint, we're we're extremely close. That's also a similarity. Um, they're on the west western side of a continent. We're on the eastern side of a continent. That's not a, a similarity. Um, the varieties that we we have here uh, predominantly are, are what they grow. So I think there's a, there's a lot of there's a lot of reasons why. I think initially. Um, uh, in the 80s and the 90s, uh, uh, Long Island, you know, was starting, and they looked to to uh, we looked to Bordeaux uh, somewhat for guidance or direction. Uh, oh. um, that's become less and less now. Um, again, I think because we've we found ourselves, and I think we're 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 experimenting with other varieties. So um, it's not like it's 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 lost its 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 comparison, but it's it's we we don't talk about it as much. Uh, I, think, yeah, I think I think in the 80s and 90s, um, you know, when when Parker was was leading, you know, most of the the drive for 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 big red wine consumption that that uh, linking to Bordeaux is is not a, a, a bad call by any sense, uh, but trends change. So uh, this is a lovely wine, um, texturally um, really great. I actually, I think that the, the Hungarian oak is is really smart because it's just a mild little touch, bit of spice. Uh, not not overbearing on the oak at all. Um, it's still quite fresh, and uh, fruit characteristic is great. It's smooth. It goes down great. Um, I I look forward to this with with dinner tonight. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Um, I know we went uh, a bit over time. I'm going to go kind of quickly through our just kind of uh, sustainability slide uh, because I do want to make mention of of Long Island's kind of influence there, uh, as well as some closing points. Uh, uh, and so I appreciate you sticking with us. Um, obviously, we've talked a lot about the, the New York Wine and Grape Foundation sustainability program that has launched, uh, and um, I encourage you to, to, to spend time with that. If you haven't already, we're going to do a sustainability webinar uh, similar to this uh, down the line this year, which I look forward to. Uh, and as Russell said earlier, it's incredibly important for, for not only our, our New York State wineries, but particularly our Long Island wineries. Uh, Long Island Sustainable Wine Growing, LISW, is the first third party certification for sustainable wine growing in the Eastern United States. Uh, it's a non-for-profit that provides education and certification for Long Island vineyards uh, using international standards of sustainable practices that have been refined for the Northeast. <laughs> Uh, at time of publishing our guide, there were 23 vineyards and over 1,000 acres certified by um, LISW, representing over half of the Long Island AVA. And so um, while it is a worldwide objective uh, and a big New York State objective, uh, Long Island has been there and, and living it and doing it, and, um, and they deserve some, some credit for that, uh, for sure. Russell, anything else there? No, I think you've covered it very well. All you. right, good. Uh, fantastic. I uh, haven't seen any questions come through, but now's your chance. If you got anything else for Russell, um, just to finish uh, our value proposition, Long Island wines offer incredible value. Uh, you know, they boast a wide breadth of styles and varieties. Um, I mean, and I, I've said that about most of our Long Island regions and in New York State in general, but man, Long Island uh, is is really this kind of like this experimental hotbed for for varieties, um, uh, and and I think that it's such a fun place to explore. 
uh, the, the different styles and, and varieties that you could try just in a, in a short day trip is, is really impressive. Uh, and we've got this world-class, cool maritime climate. So fresh, lively wines, moderate alcohol, lots of flavor. Uh, with the overwhelming majority of producers being small, family-owned, and operated, you're getting an artisan product uh, rooted in unique and fascinating terroir. Uh, and that's a South Fork image in case you were curious, folks. Uh, Long Island wines have been growing European vinifera grapes from the beginning, uh, and they are celebrating their 50th anniversary this year. Uh, a lot of events and, and promotions going on uh, throughout the summer celebrating this milestone, uh, so please check in there. Uh, Long Island, again, vinifies from a lot of grape varieties, really something for everybody. Uh, it's not just a, a catchy slogan. Uh, and uh, we've got terroir-driven wines bearing the mark of specific vineyard sites, individual winemakers who understand balance. Uh, and our wines are obviously fantastic with food uh, and the spectrum of styles. Um, you know, there really is something for every meal, particularly uh, what you expect to be eating out at a beach, seaside, maritime community, lots of seafood, a lot of fresh foods, a lot of grills, a lot of barbecues. Uh, it is the way to go. Uh, that's it for me. Russell, any last uh, last words? No, I think that, uh, uh, I think the point that I would like to, re-emphasizes what you just said is very, very fruit friendly wines. I think that's very, very important. I, I'm, I'm a big believer that uh, food is a part of the meal. Uh, it's, it shouldn't overwhelm the meal. And, mm -hmm. uh, so uh, the lighter alcohol, the crisper uh, acidity, the, 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 lower uh, the lower tannin from barrel uh, exposure is, is all about matching with food and blending with, with food versus overwhelming it. So yes, that's, that's what our region does best. Fantastic. Uh, my last visit out to the region, my, my remit was to produce a video celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Long Island uh, wine region, and uh, that'll be released uh, hopefully soon. I encourage uh, everyone to check it out. It'll be released by uh, Long Island Wine Growing, and uh, um, it was just so much fun. Uh, congratulations on 50 years, and we are all so excited for the next 50. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, Russell. Really appreciate it. Same here. Thank you. Good to see you. Bye now.